Okay. Well, welcome to the uh, hybrid EMT class. My name is Jeff Messerol, and I will be one of your uh, primary instructors uh, doing the uh, lectures for you. And there's uh, no better place to start than at the beginning. So, so we'll look at the involvement of uh, emergency medical service uh, systems here. Okay, well, how it all began. You know, in the 1790s, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, Jean-Luc Luray, um, Napoleon's battlefield surgeon, uh, developed uh, these flying ambulances, is what they called them. Uh, they essentially were wooden, horse-drawn wooden boxes uh, where they could uh, slide some people on stretchers uh, into the back and take them from the battlefield uh, to uh, the uh, hospital as it, as it was. Um, not much change during the Civil War. Uh, soldiers were put on flat, flat wagons and uh, horse-drawn and uh, taken back to uh, Army surgical hospitals where uh, if they survived their wound, they often died from mass infection. Because prior to these times, uh, penicillin hadn't been uh, developed yet, and so infection was a, a major uh, cause of mortality in, um, in uh, injured soldiers. Uh, World War I saw the uh, Volunteer Ambulance Corps uh, and the uh, advent of the uh, automobile. Uh, the Korean and Vietnam Wars, that's where we started to see uh, MASH-type units or cracker boxes. Uh, also, helicopters were incorporated to uh, get people from the uh, battlefield back to the hospital. And it wasn't until the uh, 1900s, uh, actually late 1900, mid-1900s, uh, that non-military ambulance services started popping up in the uh, United States. Uh, they were operated by hospitals and fire departments, uh, Primarily in Iowa, uh, they were operated by funeral homes. And there still are a couple ambulance services in Iowa that are, are owned and operated by funeral homes. Um, the early ambulance industry, there were no requirements or standards for equipment. There were no uh, requirements or standards for training uh, or the design of an ambulance. So if uh, I felt like I wanted to be a, an ambulance company, uh, I could take my... Uh, uh, a station wagon and uh, pop a red light on the top of it and a magnetic sign on the door that said Jeff's Ambulance and uh, off I'd go. Uh, there was no requirement for me to even be in back with the patient. Um, and that's uh, where uh, funeral homes became uh, primary operators of ambulance services. They would uh, place the patient in the back of the hearse and if the patient was dead they would Take them to the hospital if they, or take them to the hospital if they uh, were alive, and then take them to the funeral home if they were dead. In 1966 uh, was the uh, publication of uh, the White Papers, and the White Papers uh, talked about death and disability on American highways, and the Department of Transportation, the DOT was charged with developing EMS standards and an EMS system uh, because essentially the white paper when published uh, indicated that people are dying on the highways because there's nobody trained to take care of them after a motor vehicle collision. It was in the 1970s uh, where the founding of the uh, National Registry of EMTs occurred. Uh, the National Registry of EMTs, not to be confused with the National Association of EMTs, uh, was a body designed to um, uh, look at uh, certifying uh, providers at different EMS levels. And many, if not most, I think all 48 states um, use the uh, National Registry as a uh, accrediting body to certify their providers within their state. Uh, it was the National Registry of EMTs that adopted the EMT oath and the EMT code of ethics as well. In 1973, the National Emergency Medical Services System Act passed by Congress um, flooded the uh, rural areas of, of the United States with money uh, to help develop EMS systems. And NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety uh, Association, uh, was also um, 
uh, instrumental uh, in developing standards for uh, EMS systems. Uh, NHTSA, a uh, arm or a break off of the Department of Transportation, uh, you know, we're familiar with them in publishing safety crash uh, data and those sort of things. But when it comes to EMS systems, the National Highway Traf Traffic Safety uh, Agency or, or NHTSA is um, a, a very uh, important um, organization as they're responsible for developing the uh, components of an EMS system, as well as uh, multiple publications uh, uh, throughout the last couple decades uh, that talked about uh, where EMS is uh, at this point in time and what needs to occur uh, in order for it to uh, survive. Uh, the different parts of the EMS system, according to NHTSA, one was regulation and policy. And that was uh, the national government saying that, you know, each state needs to establish laws, policies, regulations uh, concerning uh, EMS within their state. And our Bureau of Emergency Trauma Services, or BETS, uh, a subdivision of the Iowa Department of Public Health, uh, is responsible for doing that. Uh, NHTSA also uh, talked about resource management. And that was a uh, centralized uh, coordination of emergency treatment and transport resources. Um, and that's something that we struggle with. Uh, you know, resource management uh, is, does every county need multiple transporting ambulance services? And there are some counties uh, in Iowa that, you know, may have up to eight different transport services. And is that really good resource management? And I think those are things that, continue to be discussed at a national level. Uh, human resources and training were an important piece of this as well because there were no standards early in EMS uh, and now um, NHTSA uh, uh, and other groups have uh, established uh, training requirements for the different levels of EMS providers uh, and minimum standards for certification. Uh, transportation dealt with the uh, safe and reliable transportation of the sick and injured, uh, which led to the development of uh, ambulance manufacturer criteria, so that if a company wanted to make ambulances, they had to meet certain uh, criteria and safety factors when uh, making those ambulances. Uh, facilities were part of the EMS system. You know, the EMS services can pick these patients up, but where are they going to transport them? And um, we're really looking at uh, time critical conditions now uh, when it comes to transportation. Things like heart attacks, uh, strokes, and major trauma uh, all are time critical and uh, are either being transported to the closest facility uh, or the closest appropriate facility, whether it be a, a, f a facility that does um, uh, balloon angioplasty and catheterization of heart attack patients or whether it be a major trauma center. Communication was to establish a universal access number, 911, and uh, they were to dispatch ambulances. Uh, they were to dis dispatch ambulances to the scene, ambulance to the hospital, uh, and also uh, communication is important that uh, we have redundant communication, uh, more than one form of communication, so that we can not only talk with ambulances and hospitals, uh, but all our other partners that respond with this to include law enforcement, uh, fire, emergency management. Uh, public information and education was part of the uh, system development for uh, system standards. Uh, and that required us as EMS providers to educate the public about the role of EMS, how to access EMS, and, uh, and how we as EMS providers could be active and participate in injury prevention programs because some things uh, we cannot fix. Uh, only prevention can uh, fix them. Uh, and those are, uh, let's say, for example, trauma. We know that uh, the vast majority of all uh, life-threatening trauma, if not uh, um, trauma that causes death, uh, is preventable. Uh, and that prevention relies on our ability to uh, develop injury prevention programs. So that was a, a big important part of uh, EMS system development. Medical direction, we have to have oversight, uh, some medical director who is accountable for EMS 
uh, uh, people within their system. So as an EMS provider, uh, we can practice uh, EMS uh, within our scope of practice, which we'll talk about later, uh, as long as we um, are uh, uh, overseen or directed or guided by a medical director within our community. Trauma systems, uh, Iowa developed its uh, trauma system back in 2001, uh, where we looked at you know, it, ways that we could triage trauma patients and based on our triage determine the most appropriate facility for them to be transported to. We have in place the out of hospital trauma triage destination decision protocol that you'll become familiar with uh, within this uh, course. And then evaluation, uh, establishing a program for evaluating and improving effectiveness, which some would call uh, quality management, uh, total quality management, quality assurance, quality improvement. And it's just based on a concept that you know, we all know that we, when we go out and take care of patients, that we, we do it to the best of our ability. Um, but we also know there's room for improvement. And by monitoring our uh, care, uh, we can identify opportunities that allow us to improve. So uh, components of an, of an EMS system include emergency medical dispatchers. <clears throat> now, some counties have 911, uh, E911, emergency medical dispatchers, or EMDs, I should say, is what they're called. Uh, and some got them and then didn't renew because of the cost associated with them. And there are some that have never been trained uh, at that particular level. An emergency medical dispatcher has a set of cards in front of them. Uh, when they get a call from a caller, they can ask certain questions, uh, which leads them through an algorithm within the cards, uh, and they end up with a scripted message that they can uh, give the caller. Uh, it also includes EMS responders at all levels, whether it be an EMR, an EMT, an advanced EMT, or a paramedic. And then it includes the emergency department and in the, in the hospital. And within the hospital, doctors, nurses, and other allied health personnel like lab and radiology and mid-levels. And then specialty centers, whether they be, um, you know, burn units or major trauma centers or major stroke centers, those sort of things. Um, and that's what they're uh, talking about here. Um, you know, it takes all of us um, uh, in the system. We have an occlusive uh, EMS system within the state of Iowa. Uh, involving uh, everyone from the emergency responder uh, all the way to uh, the rehab person once the patient is discharged from the hospital. So it's important to know what medical services are available within our uh, community and, um, and how important it is that EMS personnel know the capabilities of your community community medical facilities because as an example we know that when when, when we're talking about stroke patients and uh, their need for a head CT if we think they're having a stroke uh, and our local facility uh, their CT scanner is down and they're putting in a brand new one well it doesn't make sense if we have a stroke patient to take them to a, a facility that doesn't have a CT scanner so knowing those capabilities is important and, of course, the consequences of uh, transporting a patient to a facility not equipped to handle the problem uh, is a delay in getting the patient the care that they need, uh, which the delay could be costly. So assessing the EMS system begins with the patient or the caller. Because uh, sometimes the patient doesn't make the call. Uh, the call goes into a comm center where an emergency medical dispatcher dispatches emergency medical responders, uh, whether they be fire, uh, um, first responders, uh, EMTs, advanced EMTs, and paramedics, uh, who then uh, package and transport the patient to the emergency department, uh, where uh, in the emergency department they're cared for uh, by not only doctors and nurses, but other allied health staff. So getting, gaining access to the EMS system uh, requires a universal number, and of course we know ours is 911. Uh, some of it is enhanced where they can uh, triangulate the, uh, where the call is coming from uh, so they'll know the location. Um, emergency medical dispatchers, as we mentioned, can provide instructions, uh, and those instructions may be uh, some life-saving information uh, to get the caller to provide some care prior to the ambulance getting there. Um, Critical decision making is a very important concept in EMS and it's very difficult to learn. Uh, critical thinking is something that you 
develop as you become more familiar with things like pattern recognition, you become more familiar like uh, with the uh, different disease processes uh, and the stages of the disease and how that affects the body as you become more familiar with anatomy and physiology. <clears throat> so critical decision making uh, is, is very difficult to teach. It's something that you learn based on experience. And um, we know that the decisions that you make as an EMT uh, often can be very time critical. Uh, whether we stay with the patient and provide care on scene uh, or we uh, move quickly and transport the patient to a facility where they can receive further care. So some examples of critical decisions. Uh, is it better to take the patient to the closest hospital or to one further away but has more appropriate uh, but is more appropriate for the condition. So if I, let's say I'm in uh, uh, Lamar's, for example, and um, Lamar's is uh, 28 miles from Sioux City, and I'm down there on Highway 75 um, between Lamar's and Merrill, and I'm uh, working a major motor vehicle collision, uh, and my patient has a, a serious life threat from their traumatic injury. Does it make sense to go back to Lamar's, or does it make sense to go you know, another 20 miles in the opposite direction to a level one or level two trauma care facility. Uh, is the patient stable enough for further evaluation on scene or should the patient be transported immediately? We're going to have to make those decisions as to whether or not we believe we have time to stay with the patient uh, and get a good history and a uh, good discussion and uh, do the things that we're taught to do or whether we just provide life-saving treatment uh, like administer oxygen, assist ventilations, cover holes in the chest, and then uh, transport them immediately. Uh, and then we're going to learn to do different treatments and provide different care. And it's just important to know uh, at what time do we provide the care. Because uh, we'll have patients that we're uh, very, very busy with because of the seriousness of their uh, injuries or their medical condition. And uh, we may not get through everything that we uh, think that we should. Uh, because uh, of the need to move the patient quickly to a, to a hospital. There are different levels of EMS training that's out there for you. You know, you got the emergency medical responder, and that was previously called the first responder. First responder is a term the federal government took over when uh, after 9-11 <laughs> to mean the first person who comes in contact with the patient, which could be the lay rescuer. <clears throat> so uh, they're now called emergency medical responders. Uh, and then you're taking the emergency medical technician course, and they were previously called uh, EMT basics. Uh, and then the advanced EMT uh, was previously called the EMT intermediate. And then the paramedic was uh, previously called the uh, paramedic or paramedic specialist. Some roles and responsibilities that you have as an EMT, first and foremost, is your personal safety. You're going to find yourself in situations that are hostile, situations that are dangerous, uh, and we all want everybody to go home at night, so uh, it's just really important that uh, you focus on uh, scene safety. Uh, then safety of the crew, safety of the patients, and lastly, safety of the bystanders. Uh, you're responsible for doing a patient assessment. 80% uh, of uh, the diagnosis or 80% of, of uh, uh, figuring out what's wrong with your patient, you're going to acquire by getting a doing a good patient assessment and obtaining a good history, and we'll talk about that. Uh, you will provide patient care, some on scene, some in the ambulance, and some in hospitals as well. Uh, it's going to require a lot of lifting and moving, so we will cover lifting and moving and the importance of doing that properly. Uh, you'll be transporting patients, uh, transporting patients from the scene to the hospital, from hospital to hospital, from nursing home to hospital, those sort of things. Uh, and then once you deliver the patient to the receiving facility, you're going to have to transfer that care to somebody of uh, equal or more uh, training. Uh, and I think one of the important things that we should keep in mind about uh, being an EMT is our role as a patient advocate. Um, many times the nurses and the doctors don't see the, the home. They don't see the scene. Um, they're not familiar with the patient. Uh, so it's important for you to be an advocate to make sure that the patient uh, information is uh, transferred properly uh, so that you paint a good picture of the uh, uh, situation that the patient's in. Um, so how would it impact an older adult patient if they were transported to the hospital without glasses, hearing aids, or dentures? 
you know, those are things uh, uh, that they rely on to, to see and to hear and, and to eat. Uh, so obviously if they couldn't see, if they couldn't hear well, if they had trouble eating, um, you know, that could be problematic for the patient. So it's important that, uh, you know, if, if, if you are caring for a patient and they're able to uh, talk to you, uh, that, you know, uh, especially if you notice they don't have their teeth in or you notice they're having a hard time hearing you, asking them about, yeah, you know, do they have hearing aids? Do they have teeth? Where are they? Uh, and then get those things for them. You know, on our routine call, would taking the time to gather these items have a negative effect on the patient care? And the answer is no, not on a routine call. Uh, again, there's only three real time critical situations that we deal with. Uh, one is a stroke, one is a, a heart attack, and the other is a, a life-threatening traumatic injury. Um, so how about assuring the home is secure and locked before leaving? And that's one of the things that, you know, you'll do as an EMT uh, as just a, a, a courtesy. Uh, if the patient lives alone and, and you've got them strapped to a stretcher and you're taking them out the door, um, they may find it more comfortable if they know that you're going to lock the door and put their keys in their purse and, and that they hold on to their purse and, you know, that sort of thing. Could the concept of patient advocacy also extend to the community? And the answer is yes. You know, the number one cause of death in the elderly is falls. So a fall prevention program for the elderly is something that an EMS provider could spearhead within their community, uh, as well as uh, poisoning awareness, pool and water safety programs for children. Uh, all those things uh, are uh, patient advocate uh, and um, uh, prevention programs that as an EMT you could be involved in. Now, you can imagine that as an EMT, there, there certainly are some physical uh, attributes or traits that uh, uh, you're going to need, uh, and one of them is the ability to lift and carry patients up to 125 pounds. Uh, the cot itself weighs about 70 pounds anymore with the power cots and their battery and that sort of stuff. And then you've got the patient on there and you've got equipment on there. Um, but uh, it, collectively, if... You and your partners, excuse me, are <clears throat> able to each lift 125 pounds. You should be able to, to carry most patients. You need to have good eyesight for distance and reading because you're going to be looking at small uh, labels and those sort of things. Uh, you should be aware whether or not you're colorblind uh, because that may affect your uh, ability to interpret some of the stuff that you um, – uh, assess as an EMT. Uh, you need to have good communication skills, uh, both oral and written skills, because uh, you're going to have to give uh, verbal reports uh, about your patient's condition to the receiving facility, as well as write a uh, patient care report. Um, you need to be pleasant. You know, I know that getting called out at three o'clock in the morning in the rain uh, is just not a very pleasant thing to do or deal with, uh, but that's what we sign up for. Uh, we don't pick our patients. We can't choose uh, the conditions that we respond in. Um, you know, they chose us, and uh, it's important that when we do respond uh, that we are pleasant, that we're sincere, um, that we are resourceful, uh, because you'll learn to do things, but in reality, uh, situations may dictate that, you know, there's just not enough room to get a longboard in here to get the patient on. So how am I going to move the patient without a longboard? Uh, you need to be a self-starter, and I think that's one thing that's uh, very common in all successful people in EMS, the ability to, uh, you know, to take the bull by the horns and uh, problem solve. Uh, you need to be emotionally stable to start with. Uh, there are many people who are in EMS for any length of time do develop post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's because uh, of the type of calls that we respond to. Uh, some of them are horrific in nature, and some of them end a person's career before it really even gets started. You need to be able to leave, lead, take control, you need to be neat, clean, uh, have good moral character, and respectful of others. Now, we'll talk about ethics being a community belief system, uh, and moral is, uh, you know, something that uh, you own, uh, that you believe in or belongs to you. Um, so good moral character is important because uh, there's no room for bias in EMS, and, and we all have biases, and it's very hard not to... Um, 
uh, allow our biases to cloud some of the uh, care that we provide. And uh, we wouldn't think so, but uh, all the research says that we do. You want to be in control of your personal habits. Um, you want to be able to uh, have control in conversation and be able to communicate properly. Um, and just as, you know, important as uh, communicating properly, you're, you're going to need to be able to listen to others as well. You're going to need to be a good listener uh, so that you can understand what the patient is trying to tell you. Uh, and, you know, it's important that uh, we approach patient care with empathy. Uh, we also approach patient care uh, non-judgmental uh, and fair, treating all patients as uh, we would want our family members to be treated. Uh, we need to keep our skills up to date. Uh, skill deterioration is common in, in EMS. Um, not that we have a lot of technical skills, but if they're high risk, low frequency skills uh, that we don't perform very often, we really need to stay up to date on those. Uh, we need to take refresher courses when our certifications are due, uh, when our CPR is due, when any of the other courses you take are due, like uh, PHTLS or AMLS. Uh, you need to go to continuing education courses, conferences, seminars, lectures. Uh, as an EMT, you're going to be required to have a certain number of uh, uh, continuing education hours in order to renew your uh, EMT when the time comes. So where will you become a provider? As an EMT, you could work for an ambulance service. You could work in a fire department. You could be fire slash EMS. Uh, rural and wilderness teams need EMTs. Uh, urban and industrial settings need EMTs. And of course, uh, volunteering with your local uh, search and rescue, fire rescue, uh, those sort of organizations. Now, the National Registry of EMTs uh, they handle all the registration for EMRs, EMTs, advanced EMTs, and paramedics who successfully complete the National Registry exams. So at the end of your course, you're going to take both a written exam and a practical uh, exam uh, that uh, uh, has been validated. Uh, and should you pass, not should, you will, when you pass the exam, uh, you'll get that certification. And uh, by passing National Registry, again, 48 states acknowledge that as a competency uh, and allows you to move from state to state without having to take their state tests or having to uh, reapply for a state license. Uh, so it does help you with reciprocity and it does help you when applying for employment. Now, quality improvement, here we're talking about continuous quality imp improvement. And it, it, it really works best if we, if, if we approach continuous quality improvement with a, um, a self-review or a self-evaluation. Uh, you'll find out in EMS that everybody's a critic and uh, we are our worst critics. Uh, but uh, we need to do a self-reflection of our care following each call uh, to identify things that perhaps we could have done better. Uh, and by doing that, uh, without beating ourselves up too much, uh, we certainly can uh, uh, make changes and improve the way in which we uh, uh, provide care. Now, everyone in an organization has a role in continuous quality improvement, uh, from the person preparing the written documentation uh, to those who are actually involved in auditing the uh, run reports. Uh, for those who obtain feedback from patients and hospital staff through uh, evaluations. Um, quality improvement also includes maintaining your equipment, making sure that when you go out on a call and you need oxygen, the tank isn't empty, uh, or when you need a specific piece of equipment, it's not all used up. Uh, quality improvement also includes uh, maintaining your uh, education, uh, you know, completing your continuing education. Um, all patient care is performed under the direction of a medical director, and we briefly talked about this already. Uh, the medical director has the ultimate responsibility for patient care because you're working under their license. Should you have a major error in the way that you provide care, that could affect the uh, medical director's license as well. Uh, medical directors are to oversee your training. They're to help develop your treatment protocols. Um, they're to allow you with information to provide offline medical direction, like standing orders or state protocols. Uh, and they're also available should you call them and uh, need some uh, online uh, medical direction. 
Uh, your role in public health uh, is, uh, you know, certainly you're in the home of these uh, patients, uh, whether they be very young or very old, uh, and you can, you know, look at their environment. Knowing that falls is the number one cause of death in geriatric patients, if they've got a lot of loose rugs uh, that they could easily trip or slip on, then uh, letting public health know that uh, or letting some family member know that perhaps you could get some double-sided tape and tape those down. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, injury prevention programs for the youth, which include uh, helmet uh, bicycle rodeos where you're issuing helmets uh, and teaching them safe uh, bicycle habits. Uh, and then uh, participating in uh, public vaccination programs, uh, certainly keeping up your uh, immunizations, uh, and then disease surveillance. Uh, should you notice a, um, you know, an influx of the number of patients that you're uh, picking up with uh, the same symptoms over a week's period of time, uh, could indicate the uh, influenza is present. Research. Research is uh, very sparse in EMS. Um, the whole purpose of research is to focus on improving patient outcomes through uh, evidence-based techniques. Um, we're really looking at something called ev evidence-based medicine, uh, not, not only in EMS, but all levels of, me of, of healthcare uh, are basing what they do on, on uh, evidence that shows uh, what they do improves uh, outcomes. Um, and when developing evidence-based medicine, uh, the process is to first uh, form a hypothesis. Uh, and hypothesis is a, uh, a belief. There's no proof to it. But uh, the hypothesis is, um, let's say, for example, uh, uh, cervical collars immobilize the spine. You know, you would think that if you put a rigid collar around somebody's neck, that it that immobilizes their neck. And then you review literature and look at the available evidence that would either prove or disprove your hypotheses. Uh, and you evaluate that evidence for uh, its level of robustness. Um, you know, things like um, a random uh, chart review is not a very effective uh, method of, uh, of uh, doing research, uh, where if you have a, a set of um, uh, training and protocols and uh, stuff beforehand and then you apply those and then you go back and look at the outcomes that the patient had that's uh, you know that's a much uh, a much better uh, research practice um, and then you know if the evidence supports uh, your hypotheses you should adopt it if it doesn't uh, then you should move on and develop look at a new one um, not all research is created equal. Some is animal research, some is human research, some is uh, um, uh, randomized trial, uh, blind, double placebo, all kinds of different things that are out there as far as the method of how they do medical research. Uh, and so you need to rely on um, uh, the scientific method that is going to produce the uh, most accurate result for what you're looking at. Uh, exacting and comprehensive studies are both difficult and very time-consuming. And um, the problem with time is, you know, we don't spend a lot of time with the patient in the field. We have them for such a short period of time. Uh, it is difficult to determine if what we do really makes a difference on the back end when they're discharged from the hospital. We do know things like early uh, CPR, early defibrillation, um, you know, those sort of things do make a difference. Uh, and then uh, once we evaluate the research and extract the data, uh, we can uh, develop an objective opinion. And we'll talk about objective and subjective information uh, when we look at documentation. So we all have biases, uh, and biases cloud the way in which we see things. Um, so some methods of reducing bias is to do a uh, prospective study. Prospective is to do it uh, at to do the study uh, live. Uh, retrospective is to go back and look at charts. Uh, randomization uh, reduces bias. If I randomize uh, the sampling that I take, uh, in other words, on even days, uh, we're going to do this. On odd days, we're going to do that. Then I really don't have any control over what type of patient gets it uh, just on the day. Uh, control groups, uh, again, um, uh, you can identify ahead of time in your study 
uh, who the control group is and apply this hypothesis only to that group. Uh, and then look at other uh, similarities uh, in other groups from other studies to see if, if uh, your um, uh, research or your data is, uh, this comes to the same conclusion that they do. Um, some types of medical research could be done on case studies and, and uh, patient care reports. Uh, they can be cohort with other organizations or other people. Uh, they can be case controlled studies where you only, again, you only look at certain things. Uh, they can be randomized controlled trials, which by far are the most uh, robust uh, type of uh, research out there. Uh, they could be a systematic review, uh, and uh, meta-analysis is another method of uh, looking at uh, data and analyzing it. So when, questions to ask when you're thinking about evaluating a study is, um, you know, identify the biases and the flaws in the methodology right away. Uh, and, um, you know, you see this, and a good example would be, let's say that uh, I've got this new drug, and uh, I want to do some research to prove that this new drug is, is uh, the cat's meow. Well, obviously, if I make the drug and I'm doing the research, there's a bias there. Uh, and then what sort of methodology did I use? Uh, again, remember, retrospective is the, you know, least... Um, uh, robust method of, of, of getting data. Um, questions to ask before participating in a study uh, is, uh, you know, what do I need to do uh, in the study and uh, what sort of information do I need to know before starting the study? Uh, you want to give it a name. You want to know who the investigator or the primary contact for the study is. You want to look at what the question or the hypothesis is that they're trying to prove and uh, what what sort of people were included in the study as well as those that were excluded. Uh, what sort of conditions were included in the study as well as those that were excluded. Um, you know, what data do I need to collect? We're good in EMS about collecting lots and lots of data, but then what we do with it once it's done is something that we struggle with. Uh, whenever you conduct a study on live people, uh, you've got to have their consent. So how are you going to obtain that consent before enrolling them in the study group? If treatment is going to be randomized, how are you going to randomize that treatment? Are you going to, uh, in some randomized controlled trials, they have a, an envelope in the back of the ambulance and on a, a specific day, if this patient meets the criteria to be in the study group, um, then you could uh, open the envelope and see uh, how they're going to be treated. So that's randomized as well. And then what sort of samples will need to be collected and uh, what sort of potential benefits uh, is the patient going to achieve as a result of your study results? Uh, the risk to the patient as well. Uh, has uh, the study been reviewed and approved by a... Uh, uh, a board, uh, does your medical director approve of the study? Uh, does your EMS agency approve of the study? Uh, all those things need to be included uh, when uh, conducting research. So that's sort of a, a brief look at uh, EMS systems, system development, uh, and um, uh, some of the things as an EMT that uh, that you'll be uh, required to uh, consider. So uh, that's the end of our first chapter, and uh, we'll move on to uh, chapter number two.